can everyone hear me? Um, thank you for your patience while we had a technology issue, as always. Um, I'm Rachel Garcia. I'm an adult services librarian here at Wilmette Library. Um, and thank you so much for coming. I did not realize it was International Women's Day when we scheduled this. Perfect time. Um, so I'm going to introduce um, Anne Sullivan, who's a co-president of the League of Women Voters here in Wilmette. Um, she joined the League Board in 2017 and has also served as Voter Services Chair, Communications Chair, and Advocacy Chair for Community Engagement. Um, and she's going to go on to introduce the other um, presenters who are involved. So thank you, Anne, and thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Rachel, um, and to the library for hosting us this evening and for co-sponsoring the event tonight. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my other co-president of the League of Women Voters of Wilmette, Lori Leibowitz. She's waving right there. Um, and, I, um, and I'd also like to thank uh, the Village of Wilmette Human Relations Commission. Uh, they're one of our other co-sponsors this evening. And before we get started with the program, I'd like to invite Commissioner Swathi Mokher to say a few words about the great work that the Human Relations Commission is doing in Wilmette. Thank you. So excited to be here and <laughs> to coordinate with um, the library as well as the League of Women Voters. Um, my name is Swathi Monker. I'm a commissioner. Oh, I'm going to turn on the better now. Okay. Um, I'm a commissioner on the Villages Human Relations Commission, and um, I wanted to welcome you all to this wonderful event. I wanted to thank the library for hosting and thank the League of Women Voters, um, and uh, just to tell you a little bit about the Human Relations Commission and what uh, we have been doing. Um, it's recently been reinvigorated two years ago um, with the goal of fostering and promoting an inclusive community um, where everyone feels safe and welcome. And I'm very proud of the work that we've been doing um, in engaging the community and implementing our work plan, um, including being a part of community events like this. So um, I'm happy we were able to make this happen. Um, <clears throat> we know that there continues to be a lot of work for us, but we're excited about the work ahead and very committed. Um, and I'm looking forward to this evening and the discussion um, from Michelle Horn and learning more about the ERA. I also wanted to state that we, the Human Relations Commission, is sponsoring um, a movie screening of 9 to 5. Um, the movie 9 to 5, uh, I believe, on March 18th. Yes, March 18th at 7 p.m. So I hope everyone can come for that. Um, and as we collaborate uh, with other organizations throughout the month, we'll be posting that on the, on the Village's mm -hmm. website. Um, I believe there's, we're also working with the uh, Women's Club of Wilmette um, for their luncheon on March 15th as well. So hope to see you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Swathi, and um, also thank you so much for being a member of the League of Women Voters. Um, we have over 180 members here in Wilmette, um, and we're part of a U.S. organization that has 900 local leagues across the country. Our organization works to ensure that every citizen is equipped with the knowledge and the power to cast their vote in every election. And there is a local election coming up here on April 4th, where we will elect our village trustees, park board commissioners, library trustees, um, and Board of Education members for the Wilmette Public Schools, the Avoca Public Schools, and New Trier High School. And on March 18th, the League will be holding candidate forums at Village Hall for the three contested local races, which are for Village Board, Park Board, um, and the New Trier Board of Education. And we'll also shortly be publishing a voter guide um, in which the candidates have provided answers to a series of questions about local issues. So uh, be on the lookout for that. It should be out in the next couple of days on our website. Um, in addition to the work that we do in voter education, um, and what we're doing here tonight, is um, we do local advocacy. And some of our initiatives are to protect the environment, to promote an inclusive community, to ensure good governance, to advocate for fair elections, and um, to advocate for women's rights, including the right, um, the right to reproductive choice. 
and we're very excited to be here on International Women's Day during Women's History Month, <laughs> educating the community about the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, the founders of the first International Women's Day, held in 1911, proposed that every year, in every country, there should be a celebration on the same day, a Women's Day, to demand women's rights. So it seems fitting that we are here tonight, 112 years later, to learn <laughs> about the full recognition of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, our speaker this evening, Michelle Thorne, is a wonderful example of how local, a local lead volunteer can make a difference, not only in our local community, um, but across the state and actually um, across the country. So Michelle um, was one of the leaders in the efforts to encourage the General Assembly to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment in Illinois. And then she shared her knowledge with leagues in other states that were advocating for the ERA, um, which eventually resulted in the amendment being fully ratified. And now the League of Women Voters of the United States is advocating for official recognition of the ERA as our 28th Amendment to the Constitution. Michelle is an Illinois attorney in private practice. She earned her undergraduate and law degrees from Northwestern and her business degree from the University of Chicago. Previously, she served as Associate General Counsel for the American Dental Association and the National Offices of the United Methodist Church. Her scholarship has been published in the American Bar Association, Chicago Bar Association, Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun Times, and other publications. Um, as I previously mentioned, Michelle's a member of the League of Women Voters of Wilmette, where her involvement in our ERA advocacy began in 2017. Right around the time that I joined too. Um, and just last week, as Michelle will tell you, there were several developments in the US Senate and the federal courts relating to the ERA. And last week, the Sun Times also published an op-ed that Michelle authored that covers some of these same current events. And did you bring the copies? Um, I did. Okay, there's some copies of the op-ed in the back in case you didn't see it. There's also some of these ERA Yes pins, which I did have on, I don't know what happened to it. And there's a <laughs> sign up in the back if you wanna learn more about the League of Women Voters, you can just leave your name and email and we'd be happy to reach out to you. Um, and then finally, if you're on Facebook, you should follow uh, the League's ERA Yes page where Michelle posts frequent updates <laughs> about the ERA. So without further ado, here's Michelle Thorne. Can you all hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, terrific. Thank you all for uh, coming tonight. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you to the library for hosting, the League of Women Voters, and the Village. I should also mention that any comments that I make are my own and not of my wonderful co-host tonight. Um, and as I say, I'm so excited to talk with all of you. I have a lot of experts already in the audience, so we can always call on some of the experts uh, if, if we have questions. But I'm just <laughs> delighted to see so many familiar faces here. Thank you so much. I have structured my talk in two parts. Um, the first part, is talking about why we need the uh, ERA. And the second part is talking about um, how the ERA is already our 28th Amendment to the US Constitution. You may not have known that. And the reason you may not have known that is because the national government has not published it and certified it as part of the Constitution. So I'm happy to talk about that as well. When Rachel originally asked me to give a program, we were talking about um, history and how the ERA's um, history would be a good topic. So I have chosen to focus on that for this first part of the presentation. Um, the problem as you work on a subject uh, and then you give a presentation, I found is the more you know, the harder it is to present. Uh, because when I started this, it was so easy. I just told you everything I knew. And that basically made a presentation. So now it's hard because I have to thin things out. So um, if I go on too long, Karen's going to give me a wink or a nod, and I'll <laughs> skip ahead. <laughs> Why should you care about the ERA? One of my uh, book club friends just asked me that. She said, are you going to cover that? I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, and I think we have to start with the Equal Rights Amendment itself. What does it say? Um, the first part is probably a part that you're well familiar with. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. I've been told it's 24 words. I have not counted it. But pretty, pretty brief, right? Um, let me break it down. 
equality of rights under the law. What does that mean? Well, um, what is equality? 3 plus 2 equals 4 plus 1 is equality. Is 3 plus 2 the same as 4 plus 1? No. And this is uh, something that a lot of opponents and, and some proponents get confused about. They think that the ERA means that everything for everybody has to be the same and you can't differentiate. That's absolutely wrong. It's equality. It's uh, a sense of fairness under the law. Um, shall not be denied or abridged. Why that weird language? Well, our Constitution is a negative rights Constitution. Um, the idea is that we want to keep the government off our backs. We don't want them to infringe on our rights. So oftentimes when we're talking about rights in the Constitution, it's in the negative. It's prohibiting the government from doing something to us. By the United States or by any state, that's kind of important too. Again, this is something a lot of folks don't understand. It's the government that's being prohibited. And it's not just the national government, it's the state government, which includes local governments. It's not private business, it's not clubs, it's not churches, it's the government. This is a prohibition against the government, uh, which is appropriate in the Constitution. Um, uh, on account of sex, what does that mean? What does sex mean? Uh, so there was a case in 2020, Bostock v. Clayton County, authored by conservative justice Neil Gorsuch, and the uh, issue had to do with what did sex mean under Title VII regarding employment discrimination. And his decision said that sex included <coughs> gender and sexual orientation. So probably for the ERA, it would be interpreted fairly broadly as well. A lot of advocates like to say that the ERA puts women in the Constitution. So I ask you, does, uh, does it say women in the amendment? It does not. They're right in substance, but not technically, because the Equal Rights Amendment is for everyone. It's for all Americans. If a man gets discriminated against, he can use the ERA. If somebody in the LGBTQ community gets discriminated against, they can use the ERA. It's for everyone. Um, but the, the largest group that it would have an impact on, presumably, is the, the, the largest group throughout history that's faced sex discrimination, which is women. So it's not wrong to say it's putting women in the Constitution. Um, when I talk about the ERA, so when I had the chance to testify to the committee of the Illinois House, which was super fun, I talked about what the ERA means to me. Um, to me, it means the American flag. The American flag stands for a lot of things, but one of the things that it stands for to, to me is what we said under the Declaration of Independence. Um, all are created equal. To me, this represents the flag. And family. Uh, we love our children, we love our, you know, if we don't have kids uh, or other family members, we try to treat people fairly. The law should treat the f members of our family fairly as well. And faith. Why faith? Well, a major tenet in, in every, uh, you know, substantial uh, world religion is the golden rule. Treat others as you would be treated. Uh, so. And that's what this is. This is basically a codification of the golden rule. I like to call the ERA the golden rule of gender equality. Um, and it's a great thing to be an advocate for. It's really fun for someone who likes to argue because you're, if you're an ERA advocate, you're arguing fairness. And people who are arguing against you are arguing that they want to be unfair. It always ends up being that if you listen to their arguments. Um, section two is important. It gives Congress the ability to enforce uh, the Equal Rights Amendment by passing legislation. A thing I want to note about this is that every branch of our national government has only the power that it gets through the US Constitution. So it's important that if we expect this to be implemented, that there be 
a anchor for Congress to implement it. And that idea of Congress only has the power that is put in the Constitution is something I'm going to come, come back to. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind. That's how it works in our government. And um, in Section 3, uh, there's a two-year lag time. So even though once the ERA was fully ratified, it was added technically to our US Constitution, it was not enforceable or didn't have legal effect until two years later. Why would they have put this in in the 70s? They put it in because there were a lot of laws that needed to be fixed and changed to comply with the ERA. Today, we have a patchwork of uh, federal and state laws that uh, prohibit sex discrimination that are sort of an approximation of the ERA, but as we've seen, those can be uh, repealed and replaced and revised and so on. Once you put something in the Constitution, it's in our foundation. Um, and I've got this wonderful t-shirt, uh, thanks to Ann Hayden uh, Stevens, a uh, wonderful artist who does a lot of, I would say, kind of women-centered art. Um, publish the ERA, support the rule of law. We live in a rule of law country. That means we're not ruled by little kings and queens, tyrants. Uh, all of our government officials are ruled by our highest law, which is the, the Constitution. Um, and that's, again, an idea that I'll probably come back to. I'll also add the comment that Alice Paul, the author of the ERA, made about uh, this amendment, which was there's nothing complicated about ordinary equality. I decided to focus on coverture because we were going to talk about history. And to me, this explains a lot, the more I thought about it. Like, how do I, what do I pick from history? And to me, this really resonates. Um, coverture, uh, you perhaps all know, but um, it's based on uh, English common law. It also was in French law, uh, femme covert. The idea is that once a, a woman marries, the husband and wife become one, and that one is the husband, <laughs> right? Um, the uh, married woman loses her legal identity under a coverture. She can't sign contracts. Uh, she can't sue or be sued. She uh, does not have rights to property she brought into the marriage. She does not have rights to property she produces during the marriage. She doesn't have rights to her children. She doesn't have rights to her body. And even under this common law, that uh, according to some sources, we had that uh, rule of thumb, which was right the, the size of the husband's thumb. It determined um, how thick a stick he could use on his apprentices, his servants, his children, and his wife to keep people in line. Um, this is all part of our common law. And our, you know, look at the date, 1765. This is what we uh, brought over. <laughs> so when, when not, not we, but European settlers. So when they came to this country, what did they bring? They brought tools, domesticated animals, seeds, disease, religion, <laughs> and coverture. Right? And this is the reason we really need to get the ERA in the Constitution because it's still in our laws. It's still part of our foundation. And the weird thing is, our US Supreme Court regularly, and I won't name cases, refers to Blackstone's commentaries. So think about that. Think about this as the standard for how we're judged. One more comment on this, and that is, um, I now pronounce you man and wife. Man, a person, wife, her relation to him. Not a separate person, right? But relation to him. Um, I should also cover, well, what about um, uh, soul femme is what they called, uh, women who were not married. First of all, it was more common in, uh, old, in earlier times to get married. But second of all, we all know that they didn't have a level playing field if they went out and they tried to earn money. They were not respected. They did not have full rights either. Basically, uh, the woman was under the control of her father. 
until she went to the house of her husband. And that's what, that is the, the foundation that we currently have in our laws throughout the country from uh, the uh, you know, uh, common law that Blackstone put together in his uh, uh, treatises and from the Napoleonic Code. This is a great case, and I tried to pick some things relating to Illinois, because, you know, why not? Um, this was an important case regarding women's rights and the use of the 14th Amendment. So Myra Bradwell uh, studied to be a lawyer in Illinois. She went to the Illinois Supreme Court and wanted a law license, and the Supreme Court said, uh, and again, coverture, coverture, she, they said, you can't even enter into contracts, you're a married woman. Uh, how do you think you could practice law? Plus, it would be bad for your femininity to to be a lawyer. <laughs> so she she's you know she was quite a uh, quite something, and she said you know I'm I'm gonna file suit in federal court under the this fairly new Fourteenth Amendment, which uh, became part of the Constitution in 1868, right? So she filed in federal court, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said we don't guarantee that you have a right to practice your profession. Um, uh, and they also said, <laughs> they said um, uh, that, uh, the, that a woman is naturally timid, so it wouldn't be you know, suitable for her, and that a uh, woman was not really meant for civil life. Uh, she, her, she was meant for the domestic sphere. So again, this is continuing, this, this uh, idea is continuing into the late 1800s. Francis Willard, how many of you have been to the Willard Museum in Evanston? Okay, pretty good. I have to admit, I just went there for the first time. But it was closed during the pandemic. I meant to go sooner. And uh, I will say also, um, our teenager was happy that I went on my own, because she's like, what, are you going to a museum? But um, it's really great. And, uh, you know, just talking about the museum, but they have, the, uh, apparently, Francis Willard named her bikes Gladys, so they have Gladys number three there. But um, anyway, it's a cool place, and she was quite a woman. So again, I'm I'm kind of favoring our area of Illinois for what I uh, you know talk about. Um, she was one of the most famous women in America of her time. So famous that she was the first woman to be um, to have a statue in our statuary hall um, at the U.S. Capitol. Illinois got to to put two statues, and they they put one of her. Um, of course, she ran the Women's Christian Temperance Union uh, out of Evanston uh, for two decades. She was wildly successful at what she did. Her women's organization was far bigger than the suffrage uh, organizations, and it was international. And she was especially good at coining phrases. One of her mottos was um, home protection. And to me, that meant she kind of recognized this um, uh, situation of coverture that women at that time didn't really have uh, the ability to go out and earn their own money. They were responsible for their kids, uh, and they were very dependent on the husband, right? And if he was uh, drunk all the time, and people drank a whole, a whole lot in the 1800s, um, uh, if he was drunk all the time, he could dissipate assets. Um, uh, he, you know, uh, could die young. Uh, maybe he beat the family, and so on. There were a lot of problems, and you know, the the women and children, uh, because of sort of coverture, didn't have an opportunity to, you know, get income from other sources, right? So, I think that maybe that was part of her philosophy with temperance. In fact, I I, I know it. She also had a motto called um, do everything. So she also embraced a women's suffrage because she thought, well, you know, if women go to the ballot, then they can get, uh, they can uh, vote for temperance and, and other things. But she definitely was a feminist. Tell them, tell them the world was made for women too. Very interesting lady. Again, highlighting Chicago, but this was a really cool thing in the late 1800s. The World's Columbian Exposition had a woman's building. And the idea was to showcase these achievements of women around the world um, and to really put them on display. 
the innovations, the inventions, the art, the design, and um, you know, it was uh, well. This was uh, this quote I particularly like. So it was uh, organized by Bertha Palmer of the Palmer House. And her quote was, it was as if the general government just discovered women, right? That they, that they could, you know, innovate. And I also like this one, more for the symbolism it means to me, but this is the forward statue in Madison in front of the Capitol. It was sculpted on site at the Columbian Exposition by Jean Pond Minor Coburn, um, who ended up retiring here in Wilmette. And to me, this forward is just so symbolic of the women's rights movement. Uh, this was supposed to be on the prow of a boat called Old Aid, and to show that we were moving forward. And to me, this just, when I was preparing my presentation, this just, I kept hearing the word forward and seeing the statue uh, in, in, in my mind. And I like this one, again, bragging on uh, Illinois, but we were the first state east of the Mississippi in 1913 to get a suffrage for, pre for the presidential election. And I think it influenced a lot of other states. But I put this up also because I love the heading on this, the rights of the people, women, are people. <laughs> right? So as you see a theme going on here, right? Michelle, and, yeah. If I could add, um, uh, just to, to brag for our our area, um, the year after Illinois gave women the right to vote, so six years before national suffrage, we vote we voted for our first women um, supervisor of Nutria Township. And she's ah, here, she's here okay. For 30 years. And she had four kids. That's actually pretty amazing. <laughs> so, Dale, I like that because I, you know, it's we live in a pretty cool area. Um, 1920, of course, the 19th Amendment, uh, women's suffrage was added, and I added in uh, red when it was certified, that's when it's officially recognized, what day do we, we celebrate women's equality? Is it when the 19th Amendment was added to the Constitution? No, it's when it was officially recognized, and that does mean something to officially recognize an amendment. What day do we celebrate for the U.S. Constitution? I know this because I'm a geek. September 17th. That's when uh, everyone signed it publicly. Uh, Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, we actually declared our independence a couple days before July 4th, but July 4th was when it was made official. So it does matter. This is what we celebrate when things are made official. I'm also highlighting this uh, sculptor. <laughs> we seem to have a lot of artists here uh, in, in the audience. But this was made by uh, an Illinoisan, um, Adelaide Johnson. I don't recall the name of the town. It's a small town. Um, but she sculpted this uh, in honor of the Women's Suffrage Amendment. And it is, I believe, in the US Capitol's rotunda. Um, and it's of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Lucretia Mott who was like an, even an earlier generation than those two. I mean, they overlap, but she was a famous abolitionist and suffragist um, and kind of motivated a lot of people. But a lot of uh, people did not like this marble sculpture. Can you, can you guess why they didn't like it so much? Pardon? They're not all beautiful and stylish. Well, that's true, it's not all beautiful and stylish. It looks kind of unfinished, right? <laughs> looks kind of rough. But that's what she wanted. The message was women's rights, right? It's unfinished. And I'm like, yeah, that's really cool, right? Um, let's see where I am. I want to skip something here. Well, I was going to also mention that um, after the 19th Amendment was added, a lot of groups that advocated for that still worked on women's rights issues. So looking at the league, for example, one of the things that they did is state by state, they tried to enable women to serve on juries. Women were not able to serve on juries. I don't think it was until like the 70s that all the states allowed women to serve on juries. So imagine having, you know, um, uh, I don't know, a uh, sexual assault claim in front of all men, right? It, 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 right? You, 
So um, the league was doing things, and it was doing it on this piecemeal basis. Again, because this idea of sort of coverture is, is embedded in our laws, and we didn't have a national uh, you know, equal rights amendment. And of course, this is where I was supposed to start, right? <laughs> so I apologize. But um, we're talking about a century of the ERA. So in 1923, uh, Alice Paul and others in the, the Women's Party proposed the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, it was a slightly different version, as you can see. Um, but the idea was that they would get equal control of their children, equal control of property, earnings, to make contracts, equal citizenship rights. Um, for a time, uh, at a period around this time, if American women married someone from another country, then they lost their US citizenship. Oh. It didn't work for American men working, marrying someone from another country, but for American women, they could lose their citizenship. Again, I mean, that's kind of nuts, right? Um, <laughs> equal inheritance right, uh, and so on. All the things that we're trying to get with the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment was first introduced, as they say in 1922, is by Republicans from Kansas, because the Republican Party was a party of abolition and suffrage. And one of uh, the uh, people who introduced it was the nephew of Susan B. Anthony, which is kind of cool. Um, and it didn't really get a lot of play until about the 60s. There were a lot of things that motivated it getting more attention. But I wanted to, again, focus on an Illinois person. Of course, uh, there's Betty Friedan in the middle. And she wrote The Feminine Mystique, which I think really spoke to the middle class and talked about you know, uh, women stuck in domesticity, not able to go out and really competitively earn a living or a lot of times. Um, and I really liked. Um, what she said, uh, which is the question uh, that these women ask themselves, is this all? <laughs> that was kind of funny. Um, and she also, uh, along with many other feminists, formed the National Organization for Women, and they made the ERA part of the platform. Um, so I do think this is one of the <laughs> catalysts for getting the ERA moving again. Um, of course, she's from Peoria, so that's partly why I featured her. And Illinois has had a mini ERA, a version of the ERA in its constitution since 1970. And I really <laughs> liked a comment by Gloria Steinem on this. So as you probably all know, Illinois didn't ratify in the first round uh, in the 70s. And Gloria Steinem was very frustrated. I liked a lot of her quotes, by the way. I read something, a lot of really smart observations. But her observation about Illinois was, Strange, Illinois already has an equal rights clause. So these men, meaning the legislators, vote against the amendment. It's an odd attitude against the rest of the country. Like, we're all right, but the rest of you can be damned. <laughs> and I, I think that's a, there's a real truth in that, which is that you might live in a state like Illinois where you feel that women are respected, that we have equal rights and so forth. But what about when you travel, or you work, or you move to another state? What will your rights be there? Uh, and should your rights vary as, as you move around? Well, I think for women in particular, yeah, they do vary quite a bit. And of course, in 72, the Equal Rights Amendment passed Congress by huge margins, look at that, 94%, 91%, bipartisan, overwhelming margins. And this is the first step of the amendment process, two-step process, uh, requires a two-thirds vote in each house. Obviously, it well exceeded it, and it was wildly popular also uh, in the general public. Um, Also, I, I wanted to tell you this. So the league became involved, I think, a little later than some of the groups. Um, was after, I believe, the ERA was passed out of Congress. And this is another Steinem story. So um, my friend Keller Barron of South Carolina was the person on the national board running the ERA advocacy efforts. And she said, 
they had a board meeting, I don't know if it was in 72, 73, and Gloria Steinem uh, came to the board meeting and looked down the list of the board members and she read aloud, she said, Mrs. John Smith, Mrs. Michael Jones, and so on, and, you know, went through the whole list, which was, you know, as it was the custom in the time to list the man's name, right, the husband's name and Mrs., and she said, don't you have, don't you, any of you have your own names? And again, you know, I know we do that for formal things, we do that for weddings and so forth, but I betcha, and I haven't researched, I betcha that's also a remnant from coverture, right? Um, you know, I'm not saying don't do it, but anyways, apparently that, <laughs> that motivated them and shamed them a little bit. <laughs> Does anyone know who this is, the lady in green? Her name is uh, Pat Hutar, and uh, she's from Glenview. She passed away, but was from Glenview. She was a major figure internationally in the 70s working on uh, women's rights. Uh, she and Betty Afanasakos, a judge in Florida, were appointed by Richard Nixon to work at the UN on uh, the Commission on Women, and ultimately they were major drafters of the international treaty uh, regarding women. It's called the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW. Um, and it was finished in 79, but they were major players, Republicans, major players um, uh, in, in this. And um, <laughs> the, uh, the, she also, well, um, talking about CEDAW, so uh, that is one, uh, we're one of very few countries not to have uh, fully ratified it. Um, countries like uh, Palau, Sudan, I'm not sure who else, but like 194 countries have ratified it, not the U.S. It's a basic human rights treaty, and it is the Women's Rights Treaty, but I think that's pretty phenomenal um, that she was so involved. I just am throwing up a bunch of things that happened in the 60s and 80s, Equal Pay Act, Title VII, which is employment discrimination, Griswold v. Connecticut, married women can use contraceptives, Reed v. Reed, the um, RBG case, saying that a woman could be, could handle an estate, that uh, Title IX relating to um, uh, education, Roe v. Wade, we know, equal credit, uh, 74, women had to get their husbands to sign to, to get credit, right? Um, and 78, pregnancy, my mom told me that as a teacher, she had to make sure to hide her pregnancy or she would have been fired. I mean, it's really, it's really crazy, right? Um, I'm going to mention that during this time period, um, there's a really interesting book um, uh, that I have back there, and it is Watergate Girl by Jill Weinbanks. Um, my book club <laughs> has pretty much read it, and we're lucky enough to have Jill here, and it really focuses on what life was like um, uh, in a competitive environment in, in those years, and uh, also I'm going to mention Jill, because she has very much helped spread the message of the ERA, and I'm really grateful for that. Focusing on another uh, local person from Park Ridge, Hillary Rodham Clinton. This was radical to say women's rights are human rights. Isn't that something? That it was radical. And of course, in 2020, the Equal Rights Amendment became fully ratified when Virginia became the 38th state needed to ratify. Um, and why do we need the ERA? And we can come back to this. If we, well, I should say, most Americans, this is a, quite a high poll number. It's from US News, 94.6%. I think more of the polls that we've seen, like Pew Research, is eight out of every 10, think that equal rights should be in the Constitution. So we the people want it, right? Mm -hmm. And this was just brainstorming. What are the reasons we need the ERA? Now, the ERA won't solve all of these things, but it will address some of these things. I'm going to take this off. We can come back to it, but um, there's a lot of stuff that it could, could impact. 
And then the, I want to end the history part coming back to Wilmette. Um, this is Arcane Wilmette. A lot of the land that we're on was her land that she got because uh, her people, the Potawatomis, were moved out of Chicago. Um, some people say that Wilmette was named after her husband Antoine, but he didn't get the land. She did. So I think it's named after her. But I, um, you know, looking at Native Americans is, is also really interesting. And I think it makes a point for the idea that you can go backwards in time, or you can go backwards in terms of progress, I should say. So, um, you know, generalizing, because there's so many different Native American tribes, but uh, in Native American tribes, uh, women, let me find my, they had uh, control, and this is generalizing, but they had control um, uh, over their children. They had control over their bodies. They had rights to the property they brought into the marriage. They had rights to the property they produced uh, during a marriage. They sat in, uh, the women sat in council with men. And in some of the matrilineal tribes, they also helped pick the chiefs or they uh, could uh, remove the chiefs. So imagine Native Americans, they have more rights than the people who come to colonize them. They, and they, they move backwards, really. Um, and I like this quote by Sitting Bull. Take pity on my women. The young men can be like the white men, can till the soil, supply the food and clothing. They will take the work out of the hands of women. And the women will be stripped of all which gave them power. So think, think of that. <laughs> um, I'm going to skip ahead to, well, not, I'm not skipping, actually. But now I know this is, this is a little dry. And my daughter says, well, you know so much about this. Because, oh, yeah, OK, got it. My, my daughter says, you know so much about this because um, you uh, have monopolized the book Ratification from the Wilmette Library, and you keep letting it get overdue, and then you return it and you check it out right away, and nobody can see things, that's why you, you know so much about it, but that's, that's not true. It's, we have a, joke, a running joke about that. The ERA is our 28th Amendment to the Constitution. We know this. The Constitution is like a social contract. It's an ongoing agreement. And like any good ongoing agreement, it has an amending provision. That's called Article 5. Article 5 is one paragraph. I think it's even just one sentence long. It's really a grammatically mangled paragraph. I will tell you that. Like your English teacher would use red pen on it for sure. But the amending process is clear. Don't believe people who say it's not clear. It is clear, at least for this uh, particular situation. It's absolutely clear. There are two steps. We talked about what happened in 72. The amendment was proposed by Congress by over two-thirds vote in each House of Congress. That's step one. Step two is three-quarters of the states ratify it. That's 38 of 50. Both of these took place. I want to focus on the word ratification. And this was inspired by the late Justice Antonin Scalia. I also monopolized all of his books. <laughs> and. Um, on constitutional interpretation. And it's his tools of constitutional interpretation that make this clear 500%, looking at the text in the original meaning. And he liked to define words, what does, you know, what different words mean. What does ratify mean? Ratify is a really specialized term in law. It's from agency law. And it means that there's a principle and an agent, and the principle by ratifying is adopting and authorizing the act of the agent. In the context of our Article 5, uh, the principal are the states, and the agent is Congress. They're not co-equal parties. The amending uh, process is all about the states. When the states uh, got into the 1787 Constitution, they were giving up rights. They were independent sovereigns. And um, they also got a one-size-fits-all document that was uh, drafted behind closed doors in 1787. So they're presented with this document. They're giving up power, uh, setting up this new national government, which uh, for 10 years had kind of just been a Senate. Each of the 13 states had one vote uh, in the Senate, 
and this, there's this new national government, right? An executive branch, a judiciary, which quite frankly was the least important. <laughs> Let me say that, the judiciary was the least important <laughs> of the branches. Um, and, uh, you know, a two-chambered legislature, right, a Congress. So it was completely new. And um, it was the Congress that had the job to propose amendments. Well, well that made sense, right? Congress is a representative body for the people and the states, and it would make sense to have that body propose amendments and not have amendments come from all over the place, right? There's a sitting body. All they do is propose amendments. If I propose marriage to someone, are we married? No, it's just proposing. That's all Congress does. Hey, here's an amendment I came up with. Do you like it? And then the states are the final decision makers. They're the principals, and when they ratify, that means that they've authorized and adopted the amendment. And it's such a formal act, you cannot revoke it. This is all clear. And Article 5 has no time limit on when amendments have to be ratified. And there's no authority for Congress to set a time limit on the states. That's absurd <laughs> for an agent to set a time limit on a principal. And as we know, Congress only gets the authority that's laid out clearly in the Constitution and no more. Um, and absolutely no rescissions based on the definition of the word ratify, based on our constitutional history. Uh, when New York was considering ratifying the U.S. Constitution, the New York Ratification Convention, I know this because of the ratification book, um, <laughs> they were kind of reluctant to sign on to the Constitution. They wanted to, but um, they wanted a Bill of Rights, among other things. So Alexander Hamilton wrote to James Madison and said, we're, we're prepared to ratify the US Constitution, but we want to do so conditionally with the right to rescind if things don't turn out the way we want, especially if we don't get a Bill of Rights. And James Madison wrote back, and he said, you can't ratify conditionally. There's no right to rescind. When you ratify, it's in toto and forever. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, to a certain extent, 19th Amendment, states tried to undo. That's never been used to, as a subtraction. That's never been honored. So this is you know, absolutely <laughs> clear. Um, in the law, and the ERA is our 28th Amendment, but uh, the archivist hasn't published it. And Karen was pointing to, you know, I can go on and on, and I think I've gone on too much. I would like to take your questions. We can talk about what's uh, going on in the news if you want, um, but um, thank you for letting me <laughs> share my information with you. Thank you very much. So the question is, can I, you're, you're a plant, I think, in the audience. This is the, question. the question is, what's the role of executive branch in publishing the amendment? Why does he have that authority? It's a great question. There is no authority for the executive under um, Article 5. The, that branch has, is no official part of the amending process. Um, however, somebody's got to publish the amendment. They're functionaries. It's a ministerial duty. It's an automatic duty under 1 U.S. Code 106B. Uh, look it up if you're uh, nerdy and geeky like me. It's, it's really clear. Once the archivist, and prior to the archivist, I think it was the head of General Services Administration, prior to that, Secretary of State, once that official counts up 38 uh, certified authenticated ratifications from the states, and it's like, okay, well, <laughs> that's three quarters of the state, so my next thing is to certify the amendment and publish it. Um, they don't have a substantive role. They don't affect the fact that the amendment's valid, but official recognition matters. There's a story that um, I read in one of the Scalia books um, about the Emperor Caligula, and Caligula didn't really want people to know what the laws were, so he would put them on really tall columns in very small print on the top. 
And I'm thinking, you know, at least Caligula <laughs> put it up because <laughs> neither the Trump administration nor the Biden administration have done their jobs of publishing. I think it's, it's a really clear issue. Um, I don't think that they should, uh, I think they're in uh, breach of their obligations under the, con uh, the Constitution. I talk about Article 5, the very next article of the Constitution is Article 6. Article 6 says the Constitution is supreme, it's this you know, rule of law idea, and all officials uh, must swear an oath to uphold the Constitution. And I think that the Biden administration is, and uh, previously the Trump administration were in breach of Article 6 for not doing their jobs to uphold the Constitution. We can talk more about what's going on, but yeah, Gail. Can you give us a <laughs> yeah, of her sorry. litigation? <laughs> like my, my daughter's going to be like, oh, you poor people. Just talk on and on. Um, OK. Thanks, Gail. You're a plant, too. Um, why hasn't the ERA been published and so on? OK. Um, I like that line of quote. Um, OK, what's happening? So it's, uh, why wasn't it published in 2020 when Virginia became the 38th state to ratify? Everybody knew that the first thing Virginia was going to do when its legislative session started in January of 2020 was ratify the Equal Rights Amendment and be the last st state needed to reach three-fourths. Why did they know? Because in 2019, they had a, a legislative uh, election, a state election, and they flipped uh, their legislature, and this was one of the issues. And it was ERA advocates that made it part of the ballot. And everyone knew, and it, they got their first um, female speaker of this, whatever it is, 350-year-old uh, body. It's something crazy, because it was, you know, anyway. Um, so everyone knew what was going to happen. Well, what does the Trump administration do? They, uh, through their US Department of Justice, had their lawyers issue an opinion in advance of the Virginia legislative session. And guess what day it was? It was January 6th, not 2021, but of 2020. So I'm thinking, wow, that must be like a special day for the Trump administration. And um, the lawyer who wrote the Department of Justice opinion, get this, uh, this guy in a previous stint in the Department of Justice uh, was involved with these so-called torture memos that all experts say uh, completely contradicted what the Geneva Convention said about what's acceptable, torture. So this same guy also recently had his name on a, uh, a legal memo that was released um, last summer, um, I think, or last year, about how there was no evidence whatsoever about obstruction of justice in the Mueller report. And people on the Mueller Commission lawyers said, that's absurd, that is not at all what we said. So this guy, who has been discredited by a number of people, wrote this opinion, which others, including me, have said is erroneous. And I say, I, I discredit it. The first allegation, or the first line of the legal opinion is, Congress has constitutional authority to impose a deadline on the state, something to that effect. That's a lie. There is no such authority in the Constitution. And it's on that basis that he's saying that the amendment expired. I didn't talk about the history of the ERA relating to the so-called deadline. I should cover that. So when Congress voted on the ERA in 72, in their internal resolution that they used to vote on the amendment, they had language to the effect that the amendment shall be valid when ratified within seven years. Something like that. They put it in the resolution they used to vote. It's their internal resolution. That's not part of the text of the amendment. And adding a time limit on when states can ratify an amendment, that's a huge change to the Constitution. That's a material change. That is an amendment to the Constitution. If you don't put it in the text of the amendment, it's you know lawyer 101, contracts 101. It's, it's not there, okay? It's not, it's, it's not effective. And not only that, they used that loosey-goosey language about this amendment uh, shall be valid when ratified within seven years. If a lawyer had sent that to me, and I have had uh, years of doing transactional work and reviewing contracts, 
I would have to hold back from ridiculing that person for such dis, you know, ridiculous drafting. So after uh, seven years, is it valid or not? It doesn't say. I would say yes, it is. So for that language in a resolution to be used right now to say there's a deadline on the ERA is preposterous. You might uh, respond back to me, well, then why did everyone go in 78 and ask for more time? That's a good question. I think it's power. I think what's going on is power. Um, and I'm kind of new to politics and seeing power, but I guess that's sort of a big thing. And I always think, you know, people are going to follow the law, follow the rule of law. Um, but uh, I think in the 70s, there were a couple things going on. One, uh, it was a bunch of women. There's a long history of women being ridiculed when they go in to ask for rights. I'm sorry to say, I have to write an essay on it. Like throughout history, you can talk about covert you can talk about laughing at women asking for rights, right? Um, uh, so what were the women to do when this supposed seven year deadline was coming to the end? Should, would they have, should they have gone to Congress to say, ah, we don't even have power to do that. How is that gonna go over? I don't know, right? Uh, you, they didn't hold the cards, right? Um, also, uh, all amendments prior to that time, I think, were ratified within, uh, that had been added, were ratified within about four years. So it was probably reasonable, right, to have a seven year. But that's not enforceable. Um, so, uh, you know, the deadline, that's made up. That's legally, there's like no there there or whatever. It's, there's no constitutional basis. Uh, for uh, making that enforceable. <laughs> yes? If, if President Biden uh, spends 10 minutes and directs the archivist, whatever the form is, have somebody have, you know, go over, uh, isn't Dobbs dead, isn't the grave uh, change that was made to American law uh, by, you know, our Supreme Court completely erroneous because it came after the, the time that the Equal Rights Amendment was done, and don't we go back to where we were in settled law from the 1970s? The question from my husband um, is, well, how does the ERA affect the Dobbs decision? Thank you. Um, I was going to open, and he's like, no, it's not funny. I was going to open by saying, I wanted to thank my husband for allowing me to speak to him. <laughs> See, maybe I should have done it. Okay. That's what Phyllis Schlafly always did. But he was like, no, they might not get it. Too much explanation. Yeah, you get it now. Um, so on Dobbs, and we could ask uh, our legal analyst as well, and I know Gail has been talking about it as well. Um, actually, I'd like to hear from you too if you, if you want to speak. Um, uh, I, my opinion is that um, following the rule of law, yes, it would change Dobbs. Uh, because uh, I think that the Dobbs decision was a violation of equal rights. I think that Roe is uh, reflective of equal rights and equal protection. So really what the ERA does is it fully extends the Equal Protection Clause to women as a group, kind of a sum, sum and raises the level of scrutiny for, for uh, sex discrimination cases. It's you know, kind of boring to kind of go through all that, but that's what it does. And um, I think when Roe was being considered the justices thought about using equal protection rather than due process as the basis, but they thought, oh, the states are the uh, whatever laboratories of democracy, the ERA has already been issued because uh, Roe came out in 73, and um, we'll, we'll look to due process privacy rights, which also made sense given the, a, a lot of case law. Um, but I think that, I also think under the 14th Amendment, it should be fully extended without the ERA. You know, people who say, well, why do you need the ERA of the 14th Amendment? I agree, but the su Supreme Court hasn't agreed. Um, Justice Stevens, to mention another Illinois person, um, uh, you know, Chicago had asserted that. He thought there should be an even standard. Um, yeah, I think the ERA would affect Dobbs, and I think it would be similar to Roe. Roe was not an unlimited right to an abortion. It was a weighing of the rights of the pregnant uh, person with the legitimate interests of the potential of life. Right? And anyone who's been pregnant knows there are rules about, you know, your reproductive decisions. Um, however, <laughs> I'll mention Linda Coberly, who 
um, is uh, another Chicagoan. She's the attorney from Winston who works with the ERA Coalition. Um, I have heard her comments, uh, including to me, uh, which are, well, <laughs> um, she said, you know, I think she thinks given the, the makeup of the current court, they wouldn't care. And I would say back, <laughs> if I were allowed, um, well, that basically means they don't follow the rule of law, which is a really sad commentary. She may not be saying that, um, but that's kind of my long answer, and I promise I don't know, Jill, if you want to comment since we're... <laughs> I, you make a very persuasive case. I've been fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment since 1976. I think it's time that it be the law of the land. I think that it is true that 38 states have ratified and that the ratification cannot be rescinded. I'm much clearer on that. The fact that a timeline was put in in the wrong place it was. It's in the wrong place, so you can't have a timeline. And so it should be. I tried getting an op-ed published that was a letter at first to uh, President Biden saying, you have the power to make this happen. You should instruct that it be published, or just tell your attorney general to start enforcing it and make it the law of the land. Um, and there's a very long list of reasons why we need the ERA. And you know, you mentioned Phyllis Shapley, who is also from our Alton, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Missouri, really. Missouri, <laughs> on the other side, but <clears throat> back then the argument was we can't have an equal rights amendment because women would have to pay alimony, women would be drafted, women would have to share a bathroom with a man, and. Who's afraid of that right now? Anybody in this room afraid that you might have to pay alimony? Well, women do pay alimony so. now. And women are draft, well, not drafted because we don't have a draft, but can you imagine if we reinstituted the draft that we would say only men could be drafted? That's ridiculous. Um, one of my proudest moments is having, I was general counsel of the Army. She was the first female general counsel of the U.S. Army, <laughs> among other firsts. I know. <laughs> I, I was able to get legislation passed that abolished the Women's Army Corps. Why is that important? Because women were held back by that. There were only two generals who were in that Women's Army Corps. Everybody else who was a general had to be in the regular Army. So a woman, for example, couldn't be head of the judge advocate generals because that was a regular army slot. And that seemed wrong to me that we should have those limitations. And the same thing holds true now. Women serve our country. They take an oath to a constitution in which they are not included. Right now, women are not, yes, we're included in the 19th Amendment. We get the right to vote. But we don't have equal, there's the Equal Pay Act. Lily Ledbetter Act was the first thing that President Obama signed. Why in this era are we still worrying about things like that? I'm, I'm wearing, some of you may know I wear a lot of pins. I'm wearing one that says 59 cents and someone tonight asked what does that mean? And that's because when I first started campaigning for the Equal Rights Amendment, women earned 59 cents for every dollar that a man earned. We're now at like 80 cents. So we made some progress, but we aren't one to one. And we should be at one-to-one. -one. Women should have equality. And so I just think it's, it's time we need it. We have to keep pushing. Uh, our Senator Durbin just held hearings on a resolution. You know, we can argue, and I think Michelle and I would agree, we don't really need this resolution. But it's sort of Congress saying, OK, we're extending the deadline. We're, we're going forward with this. And I'm happy to have that happen if that's what makes this happen. I don't think it's necessary, but I'll take the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment any way that we can get it. And I just think it's something we should all be telling our congressmen. I mean, I live in Janczkowski's, so I'm fine with that. Senator Durbin, we, we in Illinois don't have that problem. But everywhere else in the world does. And I think in fairness, though, we need to address the sort of the argument that rescission has been done and that it's, yes, it's a ministerial act to sign and publish, but the archivist has gotten pushback by people saying, look, we rescinded, so there aren't 38 states now. 
I think the rescission part is so clear that you cannot rescind, that that's a ridiculous argument. And he, But there are two, and you didn't mention, but it wasn't just under the uh, Biden, the, the Trump administration. There's a second opinion from the Biden administration that basically says the same thing, saying, well, we're not going to issue a new one. We'll, we'll accept the other one. And I spoke to Jennifer Klein, who is the person in charge of uh, gender uh, issues for the White House, for the Biden White House. And she said, really, what he's worried about is some of these legal technicalities that uh, Michelle would call nerdy. Uh, I don't consider them nerdy. I think they're really important. And she's not persuaded by people like Lawrence Tribe. I mean, the list of really great constitutional scholars who have written about why this should be the law. Um, you know, it's, it's every pr potential scholar, Jeff Stone from Chicago, uh, Minnow from Chicago, I mean, she's not here now, but her family is, so that counts. Um, so we're in this really tough situation of trying to get this to be recognized and for us to have the kind of quality. And I loved, I've never heard that description before about four plus one is five and three plus two is five, but it's true. There are differences that will be recognized. And so I, I'm not 100% sure that Dobbs will be eviscerated by the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, and that's partly because Roe wasn't under equal rights. It was under a different theory. But it's at least somewhere to start. And we deserve it. We are more than half the nation. And we don't have equal rights or equal pay. And so as long as that's the case, um, we, you know, and there's, there's a, a ton of other issues. I mean, look what's happening in Florida, way beyond just women's rights. Everyone's rights are at issue now. Um, and so I hope everyone here will take seriously being informed and being involved in voting, because it's, that's what it's going to take. And thank heavens we live in Illinois. Yeah. That put you on the spot, Gail, to follow it. I don't want to follow it, so I'll call it Gail. Uh, so eloquent. Uh, I'm Gail Spitzer Eisenberg. I practice in employment discrimination law. Um, and one thing I just did want to note, you know, because Dobbs was about the 14th Amendment, and we, you know, I saw this coming in the sense, you know, when from Scalia saying, oh yeah, originally it wasn't about women. Um, so it, it was coming, and thankfully Illinois had foresight to get rid of our trigger law and protect women. Um, but we can use other provisions, and I think the ERA is the provision that we're going to be using. In Craig um, versus Boren, um, the Supreme Court uh, decided that in intermediate scrutiny would be applied to gender discrimination under equal protection. And the reason why they went with that is they expressly said, the ERA is coming. <laughs> so we're going to have an equal rights amendment, and then we can have strict scrutiny and say that you, you can't have these arbitrary differences without having a very good governmental interest. Um, so the ERA could be our answer to having to regaining our constitutional um, bodily autonomy. Thank you both. <laughs> that was really well said. Thank you. Oh, you're so good. Um, <laughs> gosh, uh, and I, you know, I even had a sheet um, from Vote Equality. Um, you can do things like join the league, join Zanta, join now. Uh, a lot of groups are advocating. Uh, if you're a lawyer, bar associations have been uh, all on for the ERA, um, and you can certainly, uh, you know, well, we live in Illinois, so you can assist people in other states. We also have some. Uh, people in Congress who haven't supported the resolution. And this resolution that Jill mentioned that our Illinois Senator Dick Durbin um, just uh, chaired a committee over, um, it's a huge sea change from what we had even two congressional sessions ago. Um, and I credit Jill for helping move this incredible ship uh, because she has, uh, through her hard work and clear communication, 
uh, made ERA an issue, and, um, and, and people listened to her. So I really do credit you. We've moved from a resolution that was, oh, we need to remove the deadline, to uh, we need to affirm that the Equal Rights Amendment is the 28th uh, Amendment. That's a huge change, right? We also have um, state legislatures around the country uh, filing resolutions, including Jennifer Gong Gershowitz, and our league was one of the first uh, supporters of that resolution, affirming that the e Equal Rights Amendment is the 28th Amendment. California passed a resolution like that uh, last year. There are resolutions in at least half a dozen state legislatures affirming that the ERA is the 28th Amendment because this is something the states did. So the states should be voicing their discontent with this national government that's not following the Constitution and uh, respecting their ratifications. Um, so if you're a history person or you know, otherwise nerdy like uh, some of us, um, you should read some of those resolutions because they go through the uh, argument on why clearly the ERA is the 20th Amendment. So you can uh, support, you can try to get uh, support for the uh, it's, um, House, uh, Illinois House Resolution 20 that Jennifer Gong Gershwitz filed. Uh, Senator Fine, State Senator Fine is uh, also uh, um, going to sponsor it uh, when it gets to the Senate. So we're very fortunate. You can try to get um, the uh, Congress people in Illinois who are not on board with the uh, resolutions in Congress. Um, I think it's 25 in the House and four in the Senate. Um, that helps because apparently President Biden wants to hear from Congress, even though you know, we would say Congress doesn't need to act. It matters to President Biden to do his job. You can also, uh, you know, write letters to the editor, write op-eds, and petition the president because it's his branch that's not doing the job. And I, you know, I don't want to be too hurt on him, but he's supposed to do this. He was elected in part on women's rights, and to me, it's really clear. And I think his attorney general, who grew up in Lincolnshire, Mary Garland. <laughs> Talking about you know local folks, come on. Oh, in Skokie. Oh, it's okay. Lincoln okay. Went to Niles. Um, come on. You, you got the Department of Justice, which I think is called the world's largest law firm. Couldn't you please have some people actually look at the Constitution, look at its original history, and not go to court and argue something called dicta that is based on different facts. Dicta is something a court says in passing. It is not used as precedent in any future cases. They're using a dicta, something said in passing in a hundred-year-old case that applied to completely materially different facts to apply to the ERA. This is their basis. Guess what my basis is? The U.S. Constitution. <laughs> Which one wins, you know? So anyway, yeah, Jill. I just want to say, President Biden has supported the Equal Rights Amendment for over 50 years. He is a sympathetic audience. So I think any pressure on him, any communication to him, is worth the effort. It, he wants this to happen. It's not like he doesn't. And this is something that has been supported. I recently spoke at the um, President Ford Library in Grand Rapids, at a museum in Grand Rapids. The library's in Ann Arbor. And there's a big picture of Betty Ford wearing a giant ERA pin. I mean, this is something that has not been ignored by other administrations, by Republicans and Democrats, and he is really in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment. So he's looking for a way for this to happen. I don't know how much more persuasive you can get on the law than having the list of constitutional scholars that he has, but apparently he has chosen to listen to Engel and um, someone in his own administration. So. We need to get them moving. If anybody knows, uh, I, I'm blocking the name. Do you remember the name of the person who wrote the Biden administration OLC opinion? Well, it would be Timothy Schrader, which is an interesting person. So he's a Duke law professor. His wife um, is someone who's well known as writing about uh, women's legal issues. I'm like, come on, can you maybe talk about this? And she wrote a text along with Deborah Rohde, who recently passed away uh, in recent years, um, who apparently uh, graduated, who graduated from New Jersey, not apparently, but who apparently um, uh, debated with Mayor Garland when she was in high school, because she was at New Jersey, he was at Niles. 
uh, West or whatever it is, one of the Nile schools. Um, it's like, couldn't you constitutional scholars, I mean, women's uh, law scholars, you know, uh, couldn't you talk to Christopher Schrader? So I don't know what's going on there. It's crazy. I'm so sorry I didn't think of inviting uh, Judge Carol Bellows tonight. Oh. She lives in Wilmette. Oh, I she, didn't even she, know that. She debated Bill Shapley in the 70s. I didn't. Oh, you probably yeah. told me that. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Her, her, own, yeah. her own presentation. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, I'm really sorry I didn't. No, that would be. As I was sitting here going, oh, oh. that was such a mistake. My plan in the audience. Yeah. Is quite so, good. so uh, you gave Joe Biden an ERA pin in Iowa, and then Joe Biden and you monopolized the conversation during that campaign, and he probably put it on. And what, what did he say to you? I mean, I know, you know, but. It's but, my uh, plan in the audience. Yeah, no, so, but I mean, I mean, this is just a couple of years ago. Joe Biden's yeah. going nowhere and spends a yeah. huge amount of time with Michelle and she gives him a pin and he's smiling yeah. and well, puts what's it on. Do? But, you know, 2019, right, we went to Iowa to meet presidential candidates and we got this chance to um, hear President Biden speak in a meeting hall about this size and um, uh, afterwards, you know, said uh, thank you uh, for your service. Uh, I said thank you for what you did with the Violence Against Women Act. So he was the chief sponsor of, uh, yeah. with, of the Violence Against Women Act and uh, a lot of people think with the ERA, that act, which was gutted by the Supreme Court, they took away like a private right of action. They think the ERA could reconstitute that. I don't know, but but uh, a lot of uh, people think that. So I'm like, why wouldn't he be doing this? But anyway, we saw him um, as one of the candidates, gave him a pin, and he said to me in 2019, he said, um, he said, you know, I've been an ERA supporter a long time, and he said. And I'm going to get this done. Yeah. And at the time, I thought, what a weird statement. Does he not know how the Constitution's amended? Because it doesn't, the president has no role. Like, what? I really, I said that to Adam, like, this is, yeah. what? I'm like, this was very nice of him. Thank you. But, you know, really, I was like, that, that's kind of a weird comment. And then, you know, Trump uh, stops it. And then Biden sits on it. So I'm like, OK. <laughs> but he said that, right? So yeah, Mary. Um, since you said that the archivist's role is purely ministerial, has anyone sought a mandamus action against him? <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Another plant in the audience. So uh, yeah, our attorney general. Yeah, Mary knows. Um, our attorney general, Kwame Rule, along with the attorneys general of Virginia and Nevada, uh, as soon as the archivist didn't publish uh, in January of 2020, filed a mandamus action to command the archivist to, uh, then it was a he, to do his job of publishing the ERA. That case at the district court level was dismissed uh, in great part uh, due to standing. So the judge, Contreras, <laughs> funny name, but in DC, um, he, uh, he, is, he was an Obama appointee, but nonetheless, he, um, he said, ah, you know, states uh, don't really have standing to go to court. Uh, there's no uh, injury. There's no harm that they can show. And I'm thinking, Article 5 is all about the states. You're not giving them their, you know, honoring their constitutional ratifications. Are you nuts? That it would be like if any party can go in, it should be the states, right? Um, so, uh, and, you know, what's the injury in, in uh, not publishing? What does it mean to have the... Uh, amendment be officially recognized. It means that the executive branch of our national government, and you kind of started me thinking on this, but that they publish it and they enforce it through the U.S. Department of Justice. It means that Congress looks at its laws and updates to make sure they're in compliance with the ERA, and then also passes legislation to implement it. Uh, it means that the federal judicial branch uh, keeps it, it, takes it into account when rendering decisions. It means that state officials make sure that their laws comply and their justice systems comply. And it means that we, the people, are uh, informed that a new law is in force, right? It does mean something. But in any case, it was dismissed on standing. The states appealed. It uh, went up on appeal, you know, one a level in DC, short of the Supreme Court. And it was February 28th. So <laughs> they have, the hearings. Yeah, they have a Senate hearing to talk about the ERA in this new uh, joint resolution, right, affirming the ERA. At the same time, in the same Senate building, they are having another committee look at the new archivist, because the archivist had left. So they've got a new archivist who all the conservatives are saying, well, what are you going to do on the ERA? So that's going on at the same time as uh, 
the, uh, the Senate hearing. And during this, the Senate hearing on February 28th, in the middle of it, <laughs> Senator Lindsey Graham gets a note and he says, oh, well, there's a decision in the D.C. appellate case, and uh, the judge dismissed it. And um, well, it kind of made sense when I read the opinion. So it was a three-judge panel, and the uh, judges said, look, if you file for a mandamus action, what you're doing is you're asking the judicial branch to command an official to take an act. That's a really big deal. That's a serious thing you're asking for, and there's a very high standard uh, in order to commence uh, a government official to act. Um, and that standard is so high that uh, it has to be clear, I would say it is clear, uh, and indisputable. Well, of course it's in dispute uh, because we're in court. So they said, well, uh, dismissed it. But you know, they didn't necessarily say, they didn't discredit the argument, I would say, of the states. I don't know if that was your reading, Yeah, I, I think it focused more on the fact that there is clearly a dispute that the archivist has a right to take into account. And that dispute is, is rescission possible? Is the timeline something that prevented anybody after the time expired? So the last three states that uh, approved it after the time had expired. And that it's therefore not 100% clear that it's his obligation to ministerially do this or whether there are less than 38 approvals. And so I have better minds than I are going to have to think through how to take this to the Supreme Court and God knows in the Supreme Court what would happen. You almost uh, kind of don't want to. But, yeah. but the, the option to it is you start all over again. Oh, no, no it's about, ridiculous. It's, it's, it's not just that it's ridiculous. Think yeah. about the fact of how many red states there are that would not vote for it now. Mm -hmm. And you would never get 38 states. You just mm -hmm. wouldn't. So yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, Democrats it's, are going to have to take back state legislatures again. Yeah, that's right. true. In order to get this done. Mary, did you read the opinion? I did. Did you have a comment on it? Because um, I, I also read the. Uh, uh, ERA Coalition's um, statement on statement it, on it yeah. as well. And, and Mary Nagel is a law professor, by the way. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, and I can see why they tried to sort of take the silver lining out of the case. I, um, but I, uh, I, I think they just, I, I always am angry when a court will do what I call punting. It sort of just punt, kicked it down. I'm going to punt it away, and hopefully something else will trigger this so I don't have to decide. Yeah. That's well said. And so uh, that's the only thing I read in that decision, and I am very biased, I'll be the first to conclude that, is a lot of fear. I'm sorry, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, any, we're so lucky we have like, all of these experts here. So should we officially stop so people can leave? Oh, questions? sure, absolutely. Yeah, to you. sure, Abso uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.